Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Desire the unadulterated milk of the word like a newborn baby, that you may grow thereby. His divine power has given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust." Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth, thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we open God's word this morning, let's uh, bow our heads together and ask his guidance and direction on our study. Our Father, we live in a world where there are are so many disciples of the father of lies. The only way we can tell truth from error is from your word. For it is through taking in your word, studying it, letting your word have its way in our souls, not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we are to, able to develop skills of discernment, skills of uh, decision-making, uh, skills of life that enable us to make good decisions from a position of strength, enable us to focus on that which has eternal value. And in all of that, we are matured spiritually uh, as God the Holy Spirit strengthens us in our inner man. Now, Father, we pray that as we study your word today, coming to understand what the issues are in terms of the role of the pastor teacher, we pray that you might strengthen us in our understanding of, of our purpose. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we are continuing our study in Ephesians. And we are in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, which is a very significant passage because it tells us uh, the purpose for the primary spiritual leadership of a congregation, which is provided by the Lord Jesus Christ to his church. There's a lot of confusion over these things. If you have uh, spent your life maybe migrating from one denominational church to another, or if you've gone to the uh, nondescript, uh, generic brand, so-called evangelical Christianity in megachurches, then you've discovered that about 99.9% uh, .9 of what they do has nothing to do with biblical priorities. And we live in a world where there are a lot of people who are probably believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they have uh, never been taught anything because they, they don't even know that there are churches that exist that actually feed people the Word of God. And all of this is because the, uh, what is taught in a lot of seminaries, what is taught in a lot of churches is not based on the Word of God in terms of the ministry, mission, and the priorities of the pastor of the local church. And many pastors are not trained, and they have no understanding of what it means, as uh, Earl Rodmacher said about 30-plus years ago, that the nursery, I mean, that the evangelical church is the world's largest nursery, and the nursery workers don't have a clue how to get the babies out of diapers. And that is sad. So it's important for us to lay this down, because this is the essence, really, of what makes us as a teaching Bible church distinctive and unique among what's available among most churches. And we in Houston can thank God because there are a number of congregations. I'm not going uh, to name them because every time we have a Chafer conference, I run into somebody who's um, maybe they're Hispanic, uh, maybe every now and then we have a few uh, black pastors that, that show up. 
and they are listening to one of us who has a white congregation teaching uh, the Word of God, who has more formal training, and we thank God for them because they know what the truth is, and they just want to do the best they can with the gifts that God's given them. And there are so many congregations like this uh, throughout this Houston area, and it's been true for the last about seven, 70 years that we've had these good Bible teaching churches. Before that, they also had good Bible teaching churches, but I haven't lived that long, so I didn't go to those churches until much later where I knew most of those pastors. So we're looking at what the Bible teaches about shepherds. That's what a pastor is. The same word that's used for shepherd is the word that's used for pastor. So in order to understand what is said here in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 about this last um, Gift, gifted person, the pastor teacher, will study why it's a combination uh, gift and why it should be understood that way uh, next time. But today we're still trying to understand what it means that this is pastor teacher. And to give you a hint, a pastor has a focus on leadership and feeding. The teaching part is related to how that is done, how the gift functions. So that's how these, these two words really fit together. So last time we looked at what the Bible teaches about, uh, says about teaching, because previously we had talked about the fact that there's a lot of confusion over various translations of, of uh, these Greek words related to proclaiming the gospel, but usually it is uh, translated as preaching the gospel, and you have these other words. So there's a difference, I stated, between preaching and teaching. The verb didasko is the verb in Greek for teaching. And it has to do with giving instruction and helping people to understand what the Bible says, first of all, what it means, second of all, and third, usually makes it obvious what you are to do with it, which is application or, uh, in many ways, implication. Uh, teaching involves all of those things. And then we saw that, that in the Gospels, uh, uh, that word is used some 55 times. Eight of those refer to others te doing some form of teaching. One refers to the Father teaching. One refers to the Holy Spirit teaching. Then you have the verb keruso, which is more often than not associated with the content of the gospel. In some places where it doesn't make it clear or it's not obvious, there's a rule in interpretation that you always interpret the vague or ambiguous or uncertain by the clear, by that which is precise. You don't say, oh, over here it could mean X, Y, or Z, but 98% of the time it's used, it's related to the proclamation of the gospel. So over here it can relate to something else. That's bad hermeneutics. If it means something in 95, 98% of, of its uses, and then there are three or four where it's not as precise and it doesn't give the content, then you can assume that, that the meaning that holds in 98 or 95, 98% of the cases is the same meaning. So the clear always interprets the unclear. Preaching is... The Gospels has the gospel of the kingdom as its primary content, which is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when you get into the uh, epistles, that, that changes to just the gospel related to Christ died for our sins. So our conclusion was that the content of preaching is most often the good news of the gospel. The content of teaching is explanation of the Word of God so that people are spiritually nourished and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to 2 Peter 3.18. And we also learned that uh, the concept related to the words evangelizo and evangelium doesn't have to do with preaching something. It has to do with proclaiming the good news, proclaiming the gospel that Christ died for our sins, that we therefore have forgiveness of sin, 
and by trusting in him and him alone, we have everlasting life. So then we began to look at the topic of what the Bible teaches about the shepherd in the Old Testament, because with almost everything that we have in the New Testament, the, the meaning of terms, the frame of reference is always the Old Testament. We are to reject someone as a false teacher who comes along and says, we just need to get away from the Old Testament. We don't need to teach it. Uh, it just causes problems and disagreement and conflict because of things that are taught there. We just need to stick with what's in the New Testament. That is a popular view today, and those who hold it, I would classify as a false teacher. You cannot really understand the New Testament without that framework from the Old Testament. So we looked at Psalm 23, which speaks of the Lord as our shepherd, the Lord my shepherd, I shall not want, emphasizing the sufficiency of God's grace. We won't need anything. We lack nothing because he is our shepherd. And in summary, what we saw in looking at, uh, at that is that uh, this concept of shepherding is based on a word ra'ah. Now this is a verb. What's interesting is it, a lot of times it's, it's a participle. I know eyes are glazing over, we're getting into all of those, those words that are not in part of your skill set. But So a participle can function as a verb or function as a noun. So m nearly every time you see these words uh, translated shepherd, it's, it's this verb for feeding, for leading, for uh, tending, for shepherding, for taking sheep to pasture. That's the idea. And we see that framework set early in Genesis, Genesis 29, 7, uh, water the sheep and go and feed them, a literal, literal command, and feeding them is literally shepherd them or pasture them. Uh, Joseph is said to have pastured or, or was pasturing or feeding the flock. And so God is the ultimate pattern for understanding what a shepherd is, Genesis 49, 24. He's the shepherd, the rock of Israel. So in Psalm 23, we saw that the shepherd leads. He makes the sheep to lie down in green pastures. So that's leadership. He takes them to where there is good food and makes them rest there as a result of good feeding. Second, he leads the sheep. Leading is a primary aspect of this pastor metaphor. He restores the sheep uh, that is, when they are uh, ill or they've been wounded or they have some other health problem, he restores them. Uh, he, fourth, he guides them. Uh, in the text, he guides beside the still water. In application, that's the word of God. He refreshes them with the word of God and leads them in paths of righteousness through the word of God. The shepherd guides in paths of righteousness. He protects and corrects. This is the role of the pastor, as we see it laid out most specifically in Psalm 23. Ultimately, it is the Word of God. So he protects and corrects, and look what the Word of God does. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for instruction. Uh, the King James translated it doctrine. Doctrine is a word that is in a lot of circles restricted to the study of systematic theology. It's related to dogma. But that's not how the Bible really uses the term or that we do. The instruction of the Word of God teaches us how to think, teaches us how to make decisions, teaches us uh, right from wrong. It teaches us how we should live. And that is all part of what this word doctrine means. It's very close to how the military uses the word doctrine. It includes everything from the original uh, theoretical foundation of how they're going to build a weapon system and, and all the way to how it's used and how it's eventually used and developed in combat. 
And so when it comes to application in a military setting, you have some interesting examples. For example, uh, Lockheed Martin uh, builds the, they built the F-16 and F-35, but the, the um, uh, sort, of, sort of the, uh, uh, what would you call it, the field testing uh, environment for both the F-16 and F-35 is Israel. So these are sold to Israel, and they take them and make them better because they discover different applications. They rewrite the software. They do any number of other things. But they start with the same basic concept, which is what we would, we would call the framework of what the Scripture teaches, but its application is going to differ from person to person and situation uh, to situation. So our first example is looking at Psalm 23, and the second example, which is about where I ended last time, Isaiah 40, verse 11, talks about God as a shepherd again. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. Now, both of these words are the same word in the, in the Hebrew. It's the verb ra'ah. It is used as a a participle, uh, like a shepherd, so it's like those who feed the sheep. That's, that's how it would be understood if you did a more literal translation. And he will feed is, a, is an imperfect verb. So that's the idea here. As you see, this verb does, depending on the part of speech, whether it's a participle or a verb, is going to have slightly different sense. But its basic meaning is to shepherd, to feed, to tend um, the sheep, to lead the sheep, all within that, uh, that same uh, spectrum. So now what I want to do, and from, still from the Old Testament, is look at a couple of different examples that are given in the Old Testament of good shepherds those who are identified as shepherds, as good leaders. And we have the first example as Moses. So we look at Exodus chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, to get an idea of how this word is used initially in terms of literal shepherds. In uh, Exodus 2, 16, now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. Now we learn later that this is Jethro. Uh, this is when the Midianites were sympathetic with the, uh, with the Hebrews. We studied this a little bit in our introduction to Gideon on Tuesday night in Judges, because by the time you get to the period of the Judges, the Midianites are enemies, and they seek to oppress uh, the Israelites, and the result is Gideon's battle, which is the end of the Midianite threat. They're never a problem again. But at this stage, uh, there's, there's a great uh, support from the Midianites and from Jethro. In fact, uh, Moses will marry the daughter, one of the daughters of Jethro. Now, the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water. It, the Septuagint translates that with the verb poimino, which is the word for shepherding. It's the verb form. Uh, Poimain is the noun to shepherd. So it's literally they came and shepherded the, the, um, uh, and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. That's a different word there, but uh, it's translated water in verse 16, but it's literally shepherded. So it's taking care, it's providing nourishment uh, for the sheep. Exodus 3.1, we read these, uh, this same verb. Now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. This is the verb ra'ah, and uh, he led the flock. This is a different word. So part of tending is this idea of leading, guiding, driving, uh, driving the sheep uh, in this case, to Horeb, the mountain of God. That's another name for, for Mount Sinai. Psalm 78.52 uses it this way, referring to God's leadership of Israel. But he made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. 
So this is what God does as the shepherd, the shepherd of Israel in this case, is he guides them, he leads them. So that's the role of the pastor. That's the role of a shepherd. Another example of a shepherd is in the case of David. David was a shepherd, and he was the youngest of his brothers and sort of the afterthought of his father in some sense, and so he gets the job of being away with the sheep, which is the uh, lowest jo job or chore for the family. And, but that gives him experience because when he's out with the sheep, he is faced with many different opportunities to trust God. So he's out there with the sheep. He, is, uh, uh, he knows, uh, Scripture knows who God is. We don't know where he got that training. But we know that he is a strong believer even as an adolescent. Now, he's not a boy like you see pictured in animation, uh, animation and cartoons. He's probably not even a young teenager. He, uh, because of what he's going to say in this passage, we know that he had to be fairly, fairly strong. He is probably 17 or 18 years of age. He's too young to serve in the army, but he's old enough to be pretty, have a pretty well-developed musculature, fairly agile, and is able to do some remarkable things. So David is uh, come to Saul saying, well, who's this uncircumcised Philistine out here? Why isn't anybody fighting him? And, I'll, and then he says that he will do it. He volunteers. And Saul says, well, who are you? You're just a kid. Who do you th why do you think you can go fight this champion of the Philistines? So David says to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. Now, the word translated keep is the same word. It's ra'ah. See how many different ways this one word is translated. But if you keep it within a more narrow range, you understand uh, that it's all talking about the responsibilities of a shepherd. Uh, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And then it's translated when, and it probably should be whenever, because it's stating some things that would normally happen while he was out in the wilderness, didn't have anybody else to rely on. He couldn't get on his cell phone and call 911. He couldn't just hit the emergency button on his cell phone and have alarms go off. He couldn't pick up his uh, um, AR-15 or his 45 or anything like that. He didn't even have a sword with him. All that he had was his shepherd's crook and a uh, short like club that is usually described as a rod. That's all he's got with him except for his own courage, his own moral courage shaped and formed by the Word of God and his sense of responsibility and his trust in God. And so he says, whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it. Now you have to think about that a little bit. He's out there by himself. Now when is it normal for a lion or a bear to attack a flock? Now, there are times certainly when they attack during the daytime, but they frequently will attack at night. So if you've got a lamb that's getting, being taken by a lion at night, then you're going into the bush in the dark. That's tough. That's mental toughness at a young age, and he's trusting God. So whenever a lion or a bear came, took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat with a lion or a bear. He's not standing off at a distance. He is in, he's up close and personal, and he can smell the fetid breath of the lion or the bear, and he grabs it, and he struck it and killed it. Now, you've got to be hitting a lion pretty hard with a club to kill it because you don't want to just do it, take five or six swings at it because then you're going to lose control of the situation and it's not going to be good. This has just always struck me as one of the most remarkable statements in Scripture about somebody's courage and their, their, their strength. 
And he goes on to say, your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. See, David's whole framework is to look at the challenge from divine viewpoint. This, this isn't just a lion or a bear. He's got a responsibility over his flock, and God's given him that responsibility. He's, he has any one of us for a job, and we're going to do the best we can, and we're not going to say, well, it just looked like that was too tough for me. I'm, I'm going to do it. He's trusting God in every, every single situation. And his conclusion is, this is a great example of faith rest drill, because he concludes that the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Not much Saul could say about that. So Saul says, go and may the Lord be with you. So this is an example of what a shepherd does. He protects the sheep. Now this is the physical side, but when it is used as an analogy, that's the role of a leader because shepherd is often just it's applied to political leaders as well as as spiritual leaders in the old testament and the role of the leader is to protect the people from enemies political leader from foreign and domestic leaders and if it is a spiritual shepherd a priest or a prophet then they are to protect the people from false teaching false doctrine and the lies of the devil and so that's going to, we're going to learn that that's very much part of the responsibility of a, a New Testament pastor. Another example is in 2 Samuel 5.2 and 2 Samuel 7.8, which emphasizes the leadership responsibility. Also, uh, 2 Samuel 5.2, we read, Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, uh, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. So in all those times, when we studied uh, 1 Samuel, when David is being chased by Saul because he knows Saul, uh, David has been anointed to be king of Israel, Saul's is jealous and vindictive. And he wants to take David out so, so his own family can continue their uh, reign and dynasty. Uh, David is in the wilderness, and what's happening? All these people who are being disaffected and become homeless because of Saul's bad economic policies, and all of these people who are, uh, have gotten on the wrong side of Saul, and they can't be taken to Siberia, so they're out leaving town and going down to join David in the wilderness, and he has to take care of them. So it's on-the-job training, uh, shifting from shepherding, taking care of, and leading sheep to taking care of and leading, uh, leading people. And so the Lord said to him, you shall shepherd, this is the same word, Shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over them. So here's an example of the metaphorical use of shepherd for a ruler, a political ruler, a leader. Verse uh, 2 Samuel 7, 8, we read, Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says Yahweh Tzabaoth, the Lord of the armies, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people uh, people uh, Israel. So this is another uh, sense of the word shepherding. Psalm 78, 70, and 71 we read, reflecting upon God's choice of David. He also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes that had young, he brought him, that is God brought him to shepherd, same word, to shepherd, to tend, to lead, uh, Jacob his people, and Israel his inheritance. Now another book that says a lot about shepherds is in Jeremiah. Most of what Jeremiah focuses on are the bad shepherds, the evil shepherds. But in a couple of places he has a positive thing, or at least in this one place he has a positive statement. He says, God is speaking, and I will give you shepherds. Actually, God is speaking of what will happen in the kingdom in the far future. He says, uh, contrast to that time, he says, and I will give you shepherds, uh, those who shepherd, those who tend, those who feed the sheep, 
uh, according to my heart and who will feed you, again the use of the verb there, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. So not only are, uh, does a shepherd have the responsibility of leading, has a responsibility of protecting and guiding, but also has the responsibility of feeding with knowledge and understanding. So the word knowledge here comes from the verb uh, yada. This is just the noun form da'at, which means uh, just basic knowledge, instruction, giving them uh, wisdom. And then that kind of bleeds over into the second phrase, which is understanding, which is really wisdom. The, the Hebrew word is sakal, which has to do with, with wisdom as well. An understanding so that you can apply it in making wise decisions and you will prosper in your life. That's the idea. So the role of the shepherd is to teach, to train, to give knowledge and understanding so that the people can be successful and prosperous in, in their life. In contrast to that, we have a good look at the negatives, the false shepherds in Israel. Jeremiah 2.8 the priests are indicted for their failure to teach the word. Uh, they say, where's the Lord? See, they're atheists. They're agnostic. They're not really trusting in God at all. Uh, they say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the, um, they say, the priests did not say, where's the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. Um, in other words, let me rephrase that. In other words, when the priests are saying, where is the Lord? Uh, they did not say that because by asking that question, they would be leading them in the right direction using the question answer as a way to bring people along in your way of thinking. So they, they don't handle the law. They, they are not known by, um, they do not know God. The rulers, that is literally, it's the same word, but it's translated rulers here. Uh, those who shepherd also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. So there's an indictment here, and the use of shepherd includes both the political leadership as well as the spiritual leadership of the prophets. That's why he uses a broader term, uh, those who shepherd, as opposed to using, uh, just narrowing it down to prophets and kings. He just says shepherds that it, it covers all of the bases. And so they're leading them into false worship. They're leading them into worship of false gods. Not any different than probably 90% of professors in academia in this country are leading our children astray with totally false information. There are some good ones out there uh, and Christians out there who are very solid, but you know, you, we can't trust schools that historically we could trust. Because what has happened in, uh, in academia in the last uh, 40 or 50 years, it was happening when most of us were in university, whether it was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s, it was, it was firmly ensconced by then as well. And the political leaders. So we, we face the same situation. And as we've studied in, in Judges on Tuesday night, the human viewpoint is basically pagan monism. No matter how you shape it, that's where it ends up in pagan monism, and that what is what dominates the worldview. It has different manifestations and different looks, but that's basically what it is. Jeremiah 50, verse 6, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds, that is, those who shepherd, have led them astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. So that's what these false shepherds did. It led them astray, taking them to false, uh, false pasturage where they were not going to get good food. That's what a false teacher does. doesn't provide food for the sheep. Jeremiah 10, 21, for those who shepherd, I just went ahead and translated it that way. It's a participle. For those who shepherd have become dull-hearted and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. Jeremiah 23, you get a lengthy indictment. Woe to those who shepherd, who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Believers are Christ's sheep in the body of Christ today. In the Old Testament, Israel was God's, uh, Israel was God's sheep. 
uh, God's flock. Uh, verse 2, therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against those who shepherd, who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you uh, for the evil of your doings. Those who shepherd, same word, who feed, same word. Okay, see, see, ra'ah covers that field of meaning. It means to shepherd, which means primarily to feed, to tend, to guard, to protect, to lead. Uh, verse 3, but I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. This is a promise to eventually restore Israel from all the nations that God has scattered them and restore them to the land that occurs at the end of the tribulation period when God says, I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. That's the responsibility of the shepherd is to feed the sheep. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking. In Ezekiel, we have the negatives. Uh, false shepherds, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to those who shepherd, who shepherd Israel, who shepherd or feed themselves. Should not those who shepherd, or that is, shepherd or feed the flocks? Uh, so again and again, we just see this whole emphasis that the role of the shepherd relates to feeding, caring, leading. And so we conclude by, with this summary of the list that in the Old Testament, the shepherd is a, one who leads, guides, he feeds with knowledge and understanding. He heals those who are wounded by sin. He provides security. He restores those who are scattered. He seeks the lost, and he protects and corrects. That's the emphasis that we see in the Old Testament. Now, these things are done in the New Testament through the Word of God. We Pastors are to lead by the Word of God. They guide by the Word of God. This is the basis. Isaiah 40, 11 says that God will feed his flock like a shepherd. Again, the same words, both places. He will gather the lambs with his arms. It shows the care and the tenderness of God as a shepherd. He will carry them in his bosom and gently leads those who are with young. In Deuteronomy 8.3, So he humbled you, Moses says to the Israelites. He humbled you. He allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. That is how we are fed, according to Scripture. So what does the Bible teach it in the New Testament? First of all, Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. Direct parallel between Yahweh, our shepherd, I lack nothing in Psalm 23, 1. Now this is also applied to the second person of the Trinity because of the unity of the Godhead. Uh, John 10, 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. Hebrews 13, 20 says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." Now, that's an important phrase. Jesus is referred to as the shepherd and overseer of our souls. The uh, word uh, shepherd is the noun uh, uh, poimenos, and the word overseer is the noun episkopos, from which we get our English word episcopal. It was translated in the King James as bishop. Often in modern English, it's translated as overseer. But you see here that there's a, there is a singular article in the Greek before shepherd. The article is not repeated before overseer. And there is a rule in Greek that was discovered by a man named Granville Sharp. We'll talk more about this next week. And the, Granville Sharp recognized that when you have uh, common nouns, and in, in Greek, these are both common nouns, they're not proper nouns. In the singular, 
when there is an article that precedes, so you have article, noun, uh, conjunction, noun, no repetition of the article before the second noun, then those two nouns are referring to the same thing. That's what we learn here. Uh, and Jesus is the overseer and shepherd of our souls. Now we find this same kind of construction in Acts 20. This is when Paul is finishing up his third missionary journey. He's on his way to Jerusalem, and he really wants to speak to the pastors in Ephesus. So he calls for them to meet him, and he's going to warn them about the fact that from among them, false teachers will arise, wolves will arise who are in sheep's clothing. So, but there's a couple of words here we have to understand as we go forward in our understanding of a pastor. Uh, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus. Miletus was right on the coast. Ephesus was in, uh, up the coast a little bit, probably about 20 miles away. He called for the elders of the church. That's a different word. It's the word presbyteros, and I believe presbyteros means older. Like if you're getting past 40 and you have, start having problems with your eyes and need to go to the optometrist to get glasses, uh, you have presbyopia. You got old eyes. Okay, so presbuteros emphasizes age, maturity, something of that nature. So he is, uh, we're told here, he goes to the elders of the church. Now, a lot of times people will look at this and say, elders of the church, you have plural elders and singular church, so that means a church should have plural elders. That form of government is called the plurality of elders. There's a problem with that. There's more than one church in Ephesus, number one. Number two, you have passages in Acts that talk about the church of Samaria, singular noun, but Samaria is a territory. There's more than one congregation in Samaria. And so the singular word church can often and does often refer to a plur plurality of congregations. So an L, th this idea does not support what seem, it seems to support in the, in the King James and most translations, and that's because a lot of the translators were uh, held to uh, either an Episcopal or Presbyterian form of government uh, in England at the time. So uh, they called for the elders of the church. This is the pastors of the different congregations in Ephesus. And in verse 28, uh, uh, Paul says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's the word episkopos, to shepherd. Okay, so they're elders, they're called bishops, episkopos, overseers, and they, their function is to pastor, to shepherd uh, the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Notice it's the church of God here. It's not the church of Ephesus. So they have a role to the body of Christ, which is what we see in Ephesians 4.11, that he gave these gifted people to the church, the body of Christ, not just a West Houston Bible church or some other church or whatever, one local congregation, that the gifts of these gifted men are given to the body of Christ, not just to a single local congregation. So there's our words. You have overseers, is episkopos, and to shepherd is the verb uh, poimino from uh, poim, poimon. So elder is the office. It refers to someone who is of spiritual maturity. It's used in Titus uh, 1, 5 through 6. Then we have the term bishop or overseer. This emphasizes the authority or oversight function of this office. It's interesting, Titus 1, 5 through 6, Paul uses the word presbyteros, elder, but in verse 7, he uses, he calls the same people um, uh, overseer, episkopos. So there we see that episkopos and elder are synonyms for the same person. And what are they to do? They are to shepherd. So that puts the, those three terms together together. So the pastor emphasizes the role and responsibility of the elder bishop to feed the sheep through teaching. 
In 1 Peter 5, 1, we read that the eld- uh, Peter says, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder. And that's the word presbyteros. What are they to do? They are to shepherd. There's the verb, poimino. They are to shepherd, to feed, to lead, to guide, to uh, take care of the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. So here we see Elder, shepherding, and oversight, all referring to the same person. So we're not talking like you have in Presbyterian forms of government where the elder is different from the, uh, from the pastor, who's, and they don't even refer to the term oversight or bishop. So um, we got to straighten all this out, and it's a mess because of all these historic denominations. So the conclusion is that the role of the pastor is to lead, to guide, and feed through the Word of God. He protects and corrects. All of this is accomplished through the teaching of the Word of God. You instruct the people how to think. You help the people understand biblically how to make choices and how to trust God. And the result is that they, are, they mature. Now, next time we'll come back and look at one of the central passages uh, that we must understand. We read the scriptures earlier, but I didn't get there, and that is in John chapter 21. So we'll look at that where we learn that the mission is to feed the sheep. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to understand that where it is the job of the pastor, shepherd, to feed the sheep, It is the job of the sheep to feed, to eat, to drink. And then what happens is that what they learn is uh, assimilated into their thinking. It transforms them uh, in their spiritual life uh, into the image of Christ, changes character, changes thinking, changes actions. And so, Father, we pray that we would all be challenged in this area. But, Father, we also pray for those who may be unsaved and who are listening, either who are either here or listening online now or later, that the issue in life, the first important question that must be addressed is how, how do I have eternal life? How am I to be saved? How am I going to uh, recover from being a sinner? Well, Scripture teaches that it's not through repentance. It is not through works. It is not through ritual. It is through trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior, that he who knew no sin was made sin for us in order that the righteousness of God might be found in us, and that only by trusting in Christ can we have eternal life. We trust in him because he is the Savior who died on the cross, uh, paid the penalty for our sins, so that by trusting in him, Uh, His righteousness is then imputed to us. His life is given to us. We have eternal life. We have righteousness. And therefore, we have that life eternal that we can never lose. Father, we pray that you would challenge each of us with these truths and also those who are unbelievers, their need to trust in Christ. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's close with our closing hymn, number 13b, How Precious is the Book Divine. And then I'm going to ask Greg Freehoff to please come up and dismiss us in closing prayer, number 13b. Prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we've had to worship you today, this morning. And we're thankful for the reminder of Psalm 23 that Our Lord Jesus Christ is our good shepherd who guides us, leads us, restores us, corrects us, and protects us. And we thank you for our our local church where we have a a shepherd, a pastor to teach us your word so that we can can be uh, discerning and have our minds renewed through the teaching of your word. Uh, As we close, Father, we once again pray for those in uh, Ukraine that we know of, Alex and Eager and their families. Uh, We just pray for their protection and that they would have everything that they need from your word so that they can apply it and take comfort in it. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.